Welcome back, everybody. Um, it's been a fantastic morning so far. This is the last session of the morning. Um, we've got Michael Hurst, who's the principal data scientist from Health Economics and Outcomes Research Limited, and he is providing us with a session looking at providing structure in messy healthcare data. Michael is currently employed as a principal principal data scientist at HEOR, where where he is tasked with data mining, developing company-wide data science strategy and the design and development of budget, budget impact models and cost effectiveness models. As well as core computer science skills, Michael provides support with a wide range of analysis techniques across an array of platforms and software, including Java, JavaScript, R, Python, and VBA. He's also proficient in the tools and techniques of handling big data, including the use of SQL, and also working with several machine learning techniques, such as neural networks, random forests and support vector machines to aid in analysis and disease screening project projects. So I'll hand over to Michael to talk to us about providing structure in messy healthcare data. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. Um, so bear with me one second. Um, could you let me know if that's working okay? Sorry, yes, that's come through fine. Perfect. Uh, so good afternoon, or good, nearly good afternoon, everyone. Um, so thanks for the introduction. Um, so yeah, as uh, as it was mentioned um, today, I'm going to kind of look for almost from a pre-processing angle uh, in terms of kind of uh, some of the challenges and examples uh, that we um, fall into quite a lot within kind of our line of work. So I'm going to kind of cover um what we who we are and what we do and specifically with context around kind of decision problem that i'm going to kind of discuss about today um there are a couple of things where i'm going to ask a couple of questions uh throughout so um feel free also to get interrupted if there are any questions as i go through the presentation as well so just as a little bit of a background kind of uh yeah so I, I, as it was out, outlined i work for hr which are a health economics consultancy um so formed in about 2012 um, so we're a, we're a small to medium sized business um, and we, we exist of various different divisions. Um, so as well as kind of a writing division, we look at kind of our, our core work is uh, cost effectiveness models for um, health technology assessment appraisals. But more and more, um, we've been tasked and uh, my me heading up the data science and analytics division um, is all tasked with kind of taking data, whether it's kind of new, uh, newly generated data or retrospectively uh, obtaining existing data to kind of inform, um, inform understanding of kind of healthcare. So I mentioned previously around kind of um, HCA submissions. So these are health technology assessments, which I'll cover a little bit later on. Um, but generally, um, a lot of our kind of health technology assessments kind of fall into four kind of main buckets, if that makes sense. Um, so we usually typically take clinical trials uh, to kind of inform reimbursement dossiers or value dossiers. Uh, we, gen we generally kind of simulate um, patient cohorts based on kind of the comparisons that need to be met in order to kind of understand uh, post-clinical trial and uh, at the approval stage, um, the, 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 the relative efficacy uh, improvements of a particular um, new drug or new technology that's being integrated. And as part of that, I, and I think that kind of falls into what I wanted to chat about more, most today is kind of the, the, the notion of evidence generation. Um, and a lot of what we do is kind of informed by evidence and everything we say we have to back up and that's exactly how it should be. And uh, sometimes that kind of evidence is pretty straightforward. It's easily accessible. But sometimes um, we have to kind of use uh, whether it's retrospective or prospective kind of data extraction to inform uh, uh, to inform certain decisions that we integrate into kind of our modeling activities. And that could be from as simple as kind of um, mortality rates all the way up to really disease specific, uh, complex um, rates or, or, or instance rates, if that makes sense. And more and more, we're kind of working in the post-approval sp space. Um, so this is 
uh, post approval. So, for example, once a drug has been approved by NICE in the UK, uh, we're working more and more to kind of use retrospective data um, to kind of inform kind of uptake of that drug, not just in kind of the, the, the market that's been approved in, but also to kind of act as a blueprint for subsequent markets. And generally what I wanted to kind of discuss around today around you reutilizing healthcare data was to um, discuss these bottom two, because this is essentially kind of the core and crux of, 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 the, of, of the, the notion of this presentation. And it's all about taking, taking data sources that we've been heavily involved with or retrospectively uh, taking data sources or data sets that are available to us and trying to inform kind of the decision or inform guidance going forward. Great. So, um, so this is a nice schematic that I uh, lifted from kind of the URL on, in the bottom right hand corner. Um, so the, uh, a lot of you might have already kind of been involved in this process, but the, um, um, generally it's been covered in the media a lot in 2020, uh, as you can imagine. Um, so this is kind of generally the kind of approval pathway. So when when kind of um, when a drug or a technology has been uh, has been theorized, it's all based on a certain idea, and there's uh, research even from the molecular level um, in terms of developing kind of a technology to start using clinical trials to solve a particular problem. And those clinical trials go through generally, and not always, but go through generally three phases of uh, varying degrees of patient numbers, what we're looking at. So originally, it's all about safety. And then as the, clinic, as the clinical trials go on, it's more about kind of the safety and the efficacy of, of the particular technology that we're undertaking. And by the end of phase three, um, there's, there's a good idea of kind of what um what the relative merits of that and whether the, whether the technology is safe to safe to be used now at phase three um there's the notion of regulatory approval and there's two there's two stages to that the first is the obviously the regulatory approval to ensure that it's safe so this is the fda in the us and the um emc in europe um, to kind of say to to rubber stamp that technology um, to yeah to rubber stamp that technology and say yep yeah, this is safe for for use and then post that and I've mentioned nice before uh, is submissions to HTA bodies not just in the UK but across the world um, to kind of present the business case because take a simple example that if for example technology was worth uh, would cost a million pound more than the original technology, but there was actually relatively small improvements, then there's no real business case to to, to go for that. So there's generally a, an offset between value and oh, there, there's an offset of value in there. And value isn't isn't just in terms of cost, but in terms of quite a few different aspects as well. So in terms of kind of um, the two boxes that I pre presented to you earlier, um, one of the things around it is kind of evidence generation and filling evidence gaps. Um, so when we're going kind of going through that regulatory report approval process and the HTA process, um, as well as kind of clinical trials can be designed in such a way, there's always outstanding questions. And generally, we are tasked a lot of the times to kind of come up with evidence which is not, which just doesn't exist in kind of a published source, or whether specifically evidence exists but is either too broad uh, and not granular enough for our purposes. So, for example, if a particular piece of evidence was working in um, cancer, for example, or uh, or in on oncology, take uh, multiple myeloma, for example. And we were actually specifically looking at kind of a specific, maybe relapsed, re relapsed and refractory multiple myeloma, then obviously that's not granular enough to use. And again, similar that the evidence that's published may not be kind of specific to specific indication or label. So, for example, if you're positioning a technology at kind of maybe the second line onwards and the information is only available at first line, uh, we might need to use um, different data to kind of inform that. 
And then generally kind of one of the things I've already commented on is kind of uh, critique. Um, and we've got to kind of base everything on evidence. And we need to make sure that anything that we put forward is kind of the strongest. And we can argue that um, any any data or any data projects that we do or any findings that we do that, that inform our kind of submissions are uh, valid. And then lastly, uh, and I mentioned previously around post-approval post activities, um, and this is all about kind of communicating the merits of the technology. So this is kind of almost from a payer perspective. So even though kind of NICE says, yes, um, we're happy for this to be approved, and it, it, it sometimes in the, in the hands of payers to kind of say, okay, there's four or five different technologies available, um, and it's based on, based on their decision on what they use. Um, and we do, we're doing this more and more uh, as, a, as, a, as an organization. And we use kind of evidence um, from data sets or databases or trying to kind of um, use data to kind of inform uh, the relative merits of the technology versus the others. And um, we also kind of use um, post in, the, in this space, we also look at kind of using approvals in one HTA body to kind of inform other regions. So, for example, if you did a, if you we got approval from Nice and we wanted to kind of uh, submit to the Canadian body, uh, there's obviously kind of we might need to kind of look at certain different activities to associate with that. And we can also use real world evidence as kind of a, a blueprint for adoption in other other markets that kind of maybe a couple of years behind that are less priority. So, kind of, I've given a little bit of a background so far around. Um, exactly kind of what we do and where we work and I, I just kind of I want to kind of discuss specifically um, the different types of data we work with so generally on the left hand side we've got kind of the notion of new data so being able to kind of being involved in in studies to generate new data and usually with that is it's almost like the gold standard we can ensure that uh, our direct involvement in the design of these particular whether it's a clinical trial or expert elicitation can get the data we need uh, the obvious um, downside from that is sometimes um, if you're not careful they could be uh, marked as a bit artificial so not what's um, tips not what's specifically um, seen in real world practice and then on the other on the other side is kind of the notion of using existing data. So this is uh, retrospective access to data or retrospective tools to be able to access data within whether it's primary care, secondary care, or tertiary care. And um, so one of the things that we utilize a lot is kind of retrospective database studies, and these can be very localized or very national. So take for example the Discover database or Sale in Wales, all the way up to CPRD in HES um, and Thin for the UK. Um, and these are generally based on real world clinical practice. So it gives a good indication of what's actually happening in the real world. However, sometimes the data, we have no control over the data and the data is what it is. And sometimes it is kind of trying to transform square pegs into round holes, especially if the decision problem is quite complex and is in an area which um, is not routinely collected. Um, ECRFs is a similar kind of thing, and this is kind of, and I'm going to discuss about pre-processing a lot in a minute, but this is almost kind of uh, a pre uh, the, the notion of uh, electronic case report forms is almost trying to kind of pre-process from the data collector side. So this is kind of developing uh, a, an electronic questionnaire to uh, capture the data that we need. Uh, but this all, all, again, already relies on what's data, what data has been collected in the first place. And then clinical trials specifically for those that we haven't been involved in, because sometimes in post-approval especially, the decision problem is very different to what was done in the kind of approval process. So uh, strategy changes and focus changes. And therefore, sometimes a clinical trial, which was fit for purpose for the approval, isn't fit for purpose for uh, what we need in the longer run, especially kind of with the benefit of hindsight. So in terms of kind of the obvious choice, and I'm going to skip ahead slightly, um, obviously in an ideal world, everything would kind of involve us being able to kind of generate the exact data that we need on the fly in a really short time space, but generally that's not suitable in a lot of cases. 
Um, and even if new data is available, often it's not suitable, generally because of the time that it takes to collect the data and go through that process. Uh, governance involved and budget as well. And therefore, kind of a lot of the times we work with existing data and a lot of you probably have the same thing. We, we have to work with existing data. And it's a case of doing our utmost to, um, to be able to get to that stage. So in terms of uh, working with existing data, um, so kind of this presentation is kind of almost from the eyes of the pre-processor. Um, so pre-processor is not a... So the, the, the personnel, person or personnel uh, in the organization, whether it's the NHS or whether it's external companies that are responsible for kind of ensuring that the data is in a format or a structure suitable to be ready for analysis. And one of the things that I want to kind of know is what is kind of messy to some is not messy to other people. So, for example, we work a lot with kind of primary care GP software, um, so patient records. And generally, there's a, there, there's a very logical coding system and a very logical coding structure. And that's very kind of structured to their purposes. But when it comes to other people, based on their specific requests or needs, it can be difficult to work with. So just because I've used the words messy in the, in the title of the presentation, it, it's not, messy is a very kind of subjective term and it's very dependent on what you wanna do with the data. And generally kind of issues can be quite extensive and broad um, and addressing these issues uh, is quite important. And generally because, uh, and it co goes back to kind of, uh, everything we do for evidence and everything has to be transparent in what we do. Um, so we work a lot in the kind of published research space and reproducibility is quite a big aspect of that. Um, so generally the aim of this presentation is kind of look at, look at specific real world examples of uh, issues that we, we, um, we, we encounter uh, when working with different types of data and potential methods for addressing this. So I'm going to specifically look at three examples, but before I did, I want to kind of give a word of caution um, that generally these are just three examples. And as a lot of you might already know, is that there is a lot more. These, this is just a very, very small subset of kind of what we observe in our day to day lives um, and are, are far from exhaustive. Some are quite common and some are quite niche. Um, and one of the things that we try to kind of echo in our organization is that kind of almost uh, pre-processing or structuring the data is a bit of an art in its own right. And generally kind of um, people, personnel responsible for kind of structuring the data um, need to be kind of flexible in, and be able to kind of understand the best methods and best techniques based on A, the project, B, the strategic objective of the project, and C, the data itself. Um, some of the techniques that I'm gonna kind of discuss today are, are quite straightforward um, and should be applied generally, but then there's also, and, when, and this goes back to the art argument, that some are quite bespoke um, and some, some methods are very bespoke and should be applied when there's a reason to do so. And it's all about kind of making, being able to kind of understand uh, based on the constraints that you're working within, uh, based on A, B and C, which I covered, um, what the most suitable method is and why. And there's a, there's a, there's a commonly used kind of statistic uh, in the area um, around kind of people that were involved in pre-processing that they generally afford to do 90% of the work and 10% of the glory. And I think this is kind of a, a common conception in a lot of organizations, a lot of areas, whether it's kind of in the public sphere or the private sphere, um, that kind of people responsible from, from a structuring perspective often have their time undervalued from kind of management perspective. Uh, because kind of the understanding is that actually they jump they have to jump through a lot of hoops. And generally, one of the things that um, we try and kind of echo within our organization is that there's, there's sometimes there's sometimes ways of kind of making um, the workflow efficient, but there's sometimes you just have to do the job. You have to jump through the hurdles, if that makes sense. And therefore, we, we really kind of champion the notion of kind of given time and resources to really fully explore the data to kind of ensure that when we get to the final stage of the output, that it is suitable and fit for purpose and is valid. 
So kind of this is going to give me my first example, and this is around non-normal distributions. And this is a specific example which kind of we we echo quite a lot internally. Um, so this is kind of, in terms of kind of this example, and I'm going to cover this quite a lot in the next couple of minutes, is um, are important to reflect on how we work with the data. So in a lot of cases, uh, having a non-normal distribution for a continuous uh, measurement, for example, say it is blood pressure, uh, is perfectly fine. But we just have to consider this in terms of kind of the, the end product in terms of uh, based on a particular objective, say we're using blood pressure to answer a specific question, and that question is, has, a, has, a, has a method applied to it when we kind of conceptualize the study design um, that has specific constraints. Um, and one of those constraints is that um, the data has to be normally distributed. We need to consider that kind of early on down that line to ensure that the structure that we pass forward to analysis is of a sufficient quality uh, or sufficient to, 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 to address the research questions. Okay, so there's one quick question and I'm just kind of, just a quick note on this one is this plot was, uh, drew, uh, this plot was generated based on synthesized data. Um, so this is kind of very similar data to what we work on. Um, now, a question kind of maybe for just generally to the floor um, and apology, I can't see the output. So I'm going to um, ask the moderator to kind of uh, relay the suggestions is the question I've got is kind of based on the plot. Um, is there anyone that can kind of uh, identify what this kind of distribution might particularly show from a from a clinical measurement? Was there any suggestions? There aren't any yet. Give people a couple of seconds to come in. Not a problem. We've got finite mixture model. Richard says A and E waiting. Waiting time for something. Heart rate. Okay. Okay. Thanks for thanks for all your suggestions. So this is actually uh, around renal failure. Um, so I don't know if, uh, if a lot of people are kind of aware. So renal failure is all about kind of how well your kidneys um, process, um, yeah, how, your, how, how well your kidneys work essentially. Um, it, it's one of the kind of nice ones, to, nice ones that I like to communicate in terms of how real world evidence can be a little bit messy and kind of without kind of thorough understanding of the disease area, how it can be easily kind of overlooked in terms of how you address this. Um, so generally kind of this is based, so renal failure, so EGFR specifically, this is the filtration rate is collected off uh, based on CKD thresholds. Um, so I've, I've kind of uh, modified the GG plot to reflect the different stages. And as you can see, there is quite a massive spike at around 60 EGFR um, or an EGFR of 60. And the primary reason of this is generally um, th that um, CKD, so this is chronic kidney disease, is, is diagnosed based on a GFR of 60 or less. So this is stage three and above. Um, and therefore, kind of what we see is almost kind of uh, the rate of 60 and this massive spike um, as kind of a, almost a proxy for a CKD diagnosis. And this, this kind of echoes a lot to kind of, if we, if we try to kind of do a, if we try to present this data um, based on a research question, which was looking at using, for example, a significance test that assumed, um, assumed a, a normal distribution, then this would be, this would be completely invalid. And this kind of echoes the need to look at the underlying data. And one of the things that we, we do with any kind of data points that we look at or any data points that we're specifically exploring, we, we, we always like to have a kind of visualized, visual representation of data to know what, the, what we're working with. So in terms of kind of um, echoing to the plot that I already did, um, there's a couple of methods to, uh, one. Of, so I've got these four specific questions internally that we ask ourselves whenever we're kind of looking at new data. So the first one is the data normally distributed. Um, so generally we can use base R for that. Um, so these are specifically R, 
based uh, methods. So whether this is kind of DPQ or R norm uh, using base arm, uh, we can look at kind of histograms and frequency distribution um, graphs to, to kind of almost have a, a, a quick snapshot, a really quick way of being able to kind of understand what data we're looking at really, really quickly. The next, uh, the next question is based on kind of the methods that we go, we're intending to do. Um, do we need to transform the data in any way? So, for example, take um, take weights. For example, um, do we need to standardise the measurements so that are, are the measurements uh, in the data we look at? dramatically different. Um, so for example, are some heights measured in meters, some heights measured in centimeters? That, that's just a primitive example. But you see that a lot, especially in kind of uh, SI and conventional units as well. And consideration of operators as well. So sometimes kind of, uh, in, especially in primary care records, um, uh, general practitioners will uh, almost use um, measurement or non-absolute uh, operators so kind of uh, less than so patient's height is less or patient's weight is less than 100 kilos for example and we need to consider that and then kind of the the i think the next one is around context Sorry, so, can I, yeah sure can i give you a five minute warning please yeah, sure, no problem. I'll, 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 I'll speed up a little bit. Um, so yeah, the, the, what is it we're measuring? Don't reinvent the wheel. Um, so um, we need to kind of say, sorry, I lost my train of thought there. So are they, are they widely regarded categories to dichotomize? Um, so, what would, uh, so this essentially means binning. Um, so if there are, for example, categories that we can utilize, let's reutilize them. And then the fourth one is: um, Are there any of oh, are there any are there any other covariates that we need to consider that are highly correlated? Um, so, for example, looking at kind of S uh, systolic and diastolic pressure, the derivation of a pulse pressure to kind of understand the relationship between those two. And I think one of the things that we echo quite a lot is kind of accountability. Um, so generally, a lot of these decisions are made really early on in the process. And generally, we utilize Markdown quite a lot to kind of almost kind of apply kind of the, the logic process to understand kind of the thought process and the related outputs. And one of the things that we do champion it or we do internally a lot is kind of uh, almost see it as kind of there's different ways of exploring the data and it's kind of giving the analysis all the different ways. So for example, it's not replacing the data when we transform it, it's, it's in addition to. And one of the things that we do, and I think this is a kind of a big criticism within our industry, and I think a lot of people fall down on this, is, is don't really get clinical expertise involved. And generally kind of, if you were working in the aerospace, if you were an analyst in the aerospace industry, you wouldn't get you wouldn't do it without engineers and you won't get climate without, uh, you wouldn't, if you're working in the climate industry, you wouldn't have meteorologists on board to kind of understand that. So I'm gonna uh, skip ahead slightly. Um, so the next one, next specific example is kind of handling of outliers. Uh, and everyone's kind of probably had experience of this. And generally, um, one of the things that we do is, um, so one of the things it's important to consider is kind of when is an outlier an error and they're not uh, mutually, they're not exclude, they're not the same in a lot of cases. And we need to have that balance act in terms of kind of removal of outliers, which are deemed impossible versus implausible. And it's a very fine balancing act. So one of the things, uh, oh, sorry, so generally kind of internally we say that no, there's no one size fits all uh, there's very known well approaches so for one of those approaches is the iqr range rule um and other methods uh, such as degrees of freedom away from the midpoint so look at percentiles um or kind of more stepwise statistical testing such as grubs test however kind of going back to our original example of the gfr and i understand that's like that's not a normally distributed kind of um data point uh, we, we shouldn't just use kind of these methods willy-nilly. So taking the prior example, we know that uh, a, a observation of less than nine, an observation of 113 is perfectly valid. But kind of blind usage of kind of the IQR rule is not suitable in this case and not suitable in a lot of cases. And therefore, kind of clinical context should always be considered. Um, so A, should, are there known bounds that um, supersede kind of the outlier rulings? And if not concrete bounds, can we kind of utilize clinical insight? 
And the third thing around kind of the, this balancing act um, is around kind of impossible versus implausible. However, there's also the notion of relevance, which a lot of people forget. So um, judgment calls on kind of what bounds we imply to kind of determine what are outliers and what not are important. But what is also important is kind of extra work to understand, okay, if we do do these bounds, does it actually have any impact on the result? And that's quite an important thing. Um, but one thing that that caution must be given on advanced methods where, um, such as ML, where inferences are quite difficult to establish. And then the last example, which I'm just going to kind of quickly skirt over because I'm conscious that we're running out of time quite quickly, um, is around missing data. And missing data is quite an important uh, thing, especially in retrospective data in the healthcare industry, uh, because kind of unlike a lot of kind of areas, um, Unlike a lot of areas, the are um, healthcare um, is not missing completely at random. So what I'm so I'm, I'll, I'll share my slide deck afterwards where I've got specific examples. But I'm going to just jump ahead to kind of um, one one thing that's quite important is that generally kind of is um, the notion of missing not completely at random, which essentially means that in healthcare uh, or healthcare is prominent that there's usually a finding established to um, a, to uh, var variability in the actual measurements. And the, the the slide that I'm showing is one specific example of this, where they actually the uh, the in in warfarin. So this is in, in anticoagulation they actually found out that kind of mean time until next measurement was directly correlated with being kind of a stable range. And there's many examples of this in healthcare. And this obviously needs to be adjusted for um, in terms of kind of, in terms of how we handle this data. Um, so one of the things that um, imputation methods such, such as like loss of lacerbation carry forward, uh, whether it's, uh, interpolation or linear interpolation or more advanced methods such as uh, mice or k-nearest neighbor for example um, they're, they're very in different varying degrees of complexity and we've got to get, almost get the bigger picture uh, and one example to kind of use a mnar is, is survival analysis because that is essentially a model which actually adjusts to reflect of uh, the notion of missing not completely and random through the use of censoring so kind of just jumping ahead to the take home messages then um, that I want to kind of portray in this particular presentation is um, one of the things that like, as I mentioned to champion is kind of, uh, you shouldn't run before you can walk. So it's important that we don't skip over kind of important steps. And then um, you shouldn't be underestimated the time to fully explore data. Everyone's under the impression that obviously kind of time is quite an important point. But generally, kind of, however much uh, focus should be on kind of tr getting to an answer quickly, there should also be a focus on getting into an answer correctly as well. And again, explainability and accountability is key, especially when you're kind of making decisions early, very early on in the process, and you're getting questions. And the first time they're at, it's actually externally peer reviewed is at the stage where um, you are actually trying to publish and maybe a year, 18 months down the line, and trying to kind of go through that decision process of what were the decisions made and remembering why. And then kind of following on at that point is kind of getting the expert opinions on board. So clinical experts, other analysts, other statisticians to kind of almost kind of ensure that everything's been thought about. And that is kind of the end of my presentation. Sorry, um, it ran over slightly. Um, I'm more than happy to kind of answer any questions that anyone's had, and I will upload the full presentation because a couple of slides are skipped over um, so that everyone can have a look if they want. Thank you so much, Michael. That was a great presentation. We have got a couple of questions, but I think what we need to do with those is take them offline and follow up after the sessions. There's a lot Not a of problem. In via the chat. Um, it's been a fantastic morning. We've had a huge variety of um, really interesting presentations from all sorts of different speakers, and it's been absolutely brilliant. I'm just going to hand over to Anastasia, who's going to tell everybody what we've got planned for this afternoon. 
Uh, thank you, Janina. Thank you, Mike, again. And if any speakers are still around, thank you to you as well. Uh, well, what we have planned is definitely lunch and break because I know people uh, want to have some break and I do apologize that we didn't build it in the morning uh, program. But if I just very quickly share my screen, uh, as usually, just to remind everyone that we still have afternoon session planned and uh, please join us uh, quarter to four. Hope it's not too late uh, for you. Um, to hear some amazing talks from our colleagues from the USA. We will have a great representation from our studio. Uh, we will hear about our markdown, uh, about plumber and workflows in our studio. And we will also hear uh, about shining our markdown from uh, Carson Sieverit, who I believe worked for our studio as well, but I'm not sure. And last but not least, we'll have Alison Horst, who does amazing uh, illustrations uh, in, uh, and you can check your Twitter, by the way, uh, if you want to see them. Uh, and I think it's everything from me. Uh, so thank you again, uh, Janine, for hosting. Thank you, Mike, for joining. And thank you to all our participants for staying with us this morning. Uh, we'll see you later.